Okay, um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself as well. Um, and I had a lot of flashbacks to being an undergrad, uh, just hearing Patrick's talk and uh, talking about organic chemistry brought back a lot of unpleasant memories, just as he was sort of mentioning. <laughs> Um, but my, my major was actually in neuroscience, and um, in my major in neuroscience, one of the things that I was principally um, involved with was learning about how the brain works. And at the time, in the early 2000s, uh, we didn't really know a lot about brain plasticity. And one of the things that my lab um, that was, uh, again, working here at the University of Toronto at the Hospital for Sick Children was really interested in was how does the brain adapt and how does it adapt in terms of learning and memory. And that was one of the um, lines of research. And I have to say, I love that research. I used to work in the lab like 20 hours a day because, not because my supervisor wanted me to be there, but because I loved that research so much. And it was one of those things that I really loved the um, aspect of the theory behind how the brain changes, how neurotransmitters change, how different types of kinases change, and how the brain learned to adapt as it learned, as, as well as how memory started to form. But it was one of those things that um, as I got on and I started thinking a little bit about my research, I actually wanted to apply it. I wanted to actually know, is all this theory um, about learning and memory and all these molecules that we're finding in the lab and that we're publishing in these really high-profile journals, is this actually meaningful in any, in any significant way? And one of the things that I got really lucky with, and as um, was mentioned a little bit earlier, I was an alumni here at the University of Toronto, and one of the things that I got really lucky with, or was very fortunate um, with, was that I got to come back here to be able to teach. And I was offered this opportunity to actually come back and teach in the very same courses that I had taken as an undergrad. Just to put things in perspective um, for you, uh, my undergrad was um, a little bit different in terms of um, the types of things that students have now. My, my undergrad at the time uh, really had nothing more than a, someone standing at the very front of the room talking and we would take down notes and we would take down as many notes as we possibly could. Students now um, have very, very different types of assets available to them, but that was the way that I learned. And, I, and again, I was really excited by the fact that I got to come back here to U of T to be able to teach in the very same courses that, um, unfortunately, as an undergraduate student, I didn't do very well in. And I have to admit that um, I actually didn't enjoy my undergraduate experience um, a lot in university. It was one of those things where I felt um, that I just went through the motions of learning. I didn't really have a good opportunity to learn. And it was one of those things that I, I promised that when I came back, I would make all those things that didn't work well for me uh, work well for the students that I was going to be um, involved with. And this got me to um, read a lot. I, I knew that I, I wasn't going to be able to rely on my good looks as much as my wife said that I might be able to get away with things that way. Um, I knew that I actually had to put a lot of work and a lot of effort into translating what I did well in research into trying to do all those things that I had promised myself that I would do in terms of being able to teach. And one of the things that I started to do was to read everything I possibly could about teaching, because I had no experience in teaching, uh, about different aspects of how to interact with students. And all of these things were um, different aspects that I was trying to learn as much as I possibly could over a very short period of time before I started teaching my very first class. And one of those really weird moments when I started reading um, a journal called The, the Economist was um, a talk that, or, or sorry, an article that was um, put out there that suggested that there was a, a CEO of a company who wanted to revolutionize laundry detergent. And I, I sat there thinking, if this guy wants to change the way in which laundry detergent is being sold, um, and he wants to make the best laundry detergent of all time, why can't I do the exact same thing with teaching and learning? Why can't I think right from the get-go of, of trying to revolutionize the way that teaching and learning works here at the University of Toronto? How can I improve the experience that undergraduate students have here at the university? And that was sort of the philosophy that I had, that I was going to come in and I was going to use the same principles of working long hours and trying to get the best possible lectures that I could. Um, and that's what I worked on. For two years, I spent all this time and effort, and effort um, 20 hours a day in some cases, trying to develop the best lecture slides that I could, trying to figure out how to engage students the best that I could, um, trying to figure out through student evaluations how I was doing, how I could get better. And all of these things were um, related to ch uh, chasing after this ideal 
of this laundry detergent and making the, a new type of uh, lecture. And I think that overall, in the long run, when I look back at that particular phase of my teaching career, it was one of those things where I was really chasing after numbers. And it was really one of those things where I was trying to be the best at something for all the wrong reasons. And I was trying to be the best, not for the sake of the students, but really for the sake of the numbers that were coming back related to how effective I was as, as, a, as a teacher. And it was one of those things that um, when I got those numbers, uh, if I was a laundry detergent, you could actually see this really large bubble that was kind of um, forming and was floating up and I was getting uh, more and more full of myself in terms of what I was doing, developing just lectures and, and not really thinking too much beyond uh, the lecturing. And one of those um, watershed moments happened when uh, I ran into one of my students. And I had this one student this one year and she was a brilliant student, so she's gone on to do some amazing things. And this one student, I remember, she came to office hours. She was um, spectacular. She had like almost 100% average going into the final exam. And on the very final exam, one of the things that happened was that she had a panic attack. And she had never had one before. I could see her um, teardrops welling up because I was sitting right in front of her watching her take this exam. And I could see that um, she was going to cry, and she did cry. She had a breakdown. And um, this best student, this, my favorite student of that year, where I expected nothing to go wrong, where she knew and I knew that she was going to end up with the best mark in the course um, because she had done incredibly well was breaking down before my very eyes. This is not what I had wanted to do as a teacher at all. This is not something that I expected uh, from my student. And I asked her after like, what was going on through her mind, and she simply stressed out, and she was panicking on the spot, and she was having this breakdown that she's never had since then, but my test had um, really evoked this type of stress in her. I also had an opportunity to speak uh, not long after with a different student. And again, because of the way in which I was trying to be the best possible detergent, or I was trying to make the best possible product, rather than worrying about other things, I ran into a student and I was expecting all sorts of praise back from the students. Um, the student to tell me things like, wow, you prepared us really well for this exam and um, that you were a really effective teacher and all these um, platitudes that I was expecting back. The first thing that the student asked me was, you, you actually don't know who I am, do you? I, I thought a lot about that and I said, well, I know you're in my class, but you don't know my name. And I said, no, I have to apologize. I don't know your name at all. Um, and I was thinking back uh, to my own experience as an undergrad um, at that precise moment. And as she walked away, the student happened to turn back and say, you know, Dr. Ju, I know you're a really good lecturer and I know that you try really hard, but I, I think that sometimes uh, it must be really nice for you to live your life with, with these blinders on, that sometimes students have a lot of other things going on and it's not just the lectures that you should be worried about, it's the other aspects of what the student experience is. That got me to think an awful lot. And I know that right now, in, in terms of the, the university experience, mental health is a really big concern. Mental health is not just a concern here at this university, it's a, it's a concern overall. And it's something that we hear a lot about in the news media, we hear a lot about it in different meetings that we go to, and the reality is, most of the time, when we're thinking about mental health issues, we actually leave it to other people. We don't really think about is our class, is my course, is my teaching style, is the type of test that I do, is that actually stressing out the student and actually contributing to their mental health disorder? And I think that th these are the types of wake-up calls that I started to have. The other thing that um, also happened around the same time was uh, this experience that I had with uh, my wife. Uh, it's not that type of experience, by the way, um, but it was, a, it was also like a really... Um, mind-altering experience in a very different way. One of the things that um, I did, because my wife is uh, a professional cook, um, I don't usually do a lot of the cooking, but I decided that for that one particular day, uh, I would actually go out, get the recipe, start to get all of the different ingredients, and I started to actually put them all together. And um, then I followed the recipe to a tea, and I invited my wife to um, sample what I had just uh, cooked for her. And one of the things that um, she told me was, you know, actually, I'm kind of surprised that you cooked, number one. And number two, um, I'm actually, you know that I actually don't like this type of food, right? Because I had gone out and I created something that I liked, not something that my wife liked. 
And I hadn't really thought about that. I was just concentrating really on just getting the best possible recipe together and cooking the best possible thing that I could. And I was not really concerned as much with what my wife might enjoy. So all of these different types of things were kind of coalescing in my mind. So it's not just about making good looking slides. It's not just about trying to be an effective teacher. It's not just about trying to uh, make sure that my lectures are delivered on time and that um, all these th professional things um, are being checked off on a list. So I had all these different things that I was kind of um, mulling over. So I had things related to how do I get students to actually feel like um, they're connected with me? Because that one student who said that I didn't know her name actually really bothered me. It still bothers me to this day that that student, I, I still don't know her name. And it really still bothers me. <laughs> and, I, and I have to say that since that time, and I've given a lot of thought to this, you know, am I really doing this for the students? That's why I, why I was really hired to come here to come back and teach, is to use my knowledge of learning and memory and all of the different aspects of neurophysiology and neurobiology that I've gained over the past few years, not just to deliver a really solid product, but to really enhance learning. And, and am I doing that? Am I actually getting to reduce stress? Because stress, as you can see on this particular graph on the um, right, actually has a very profound impact on learning and memory. And I know that as a neurobiologist. The more stress that you have, the, the worse that your memory performance is going to be. And when you're coming into a test and it's a stressful situation, just like with my student, you may actually find that that stress level is going to be something that causes you to have a panic attack or a panic disorder. And in fact, what we're really teaching you is the, is the graph here on the left, which is showing you that in, in stressful situations, all you remember is the fearful response that's associated with it. We're actually teaching you about post-traumatic stress disorder in, in a lot of ways in the ways that we're teaching. The other thing that um, I knew from my own time here as well as in dealing with stress is that stress often leads to isolation. And if you're already isolated, which is, uh, again, one of those things that happens in the university. I love these types of pictures, by the way, the pictures that the university uses to get students to come here. It really looks fantastic <laughs> that you know, they're, they're happy people collaborating and working around um, a particular uh, computer on a particular project. But the reality is, when you're here in, at the university, you don't get these types of happy experiences most of the time. <laughs> And again, when you're dealing with stress and you're isolated and you're not having all of these um, supports that you see here in this picture and you're in this really large room, similar to the type of room that you're in here now, and you have this guy who's giving this really amazing talk because he's put together some really amazing slides and animations, everyone in the audience is thinking about all sorts of different things. You're thinking about why this guy is talking the way that he is, or you're thinking about what you're gonna have for lunch. And you're, even if you're in this room with a whole bunch of other people, actually, you're going to be pretty isolated because you're, individual, you're, you're put into these individual um, components where you're not really interacting with each other. You're trying to pay attention to what's going on uh, in the actual lecture. And all of these things bothered me. It bothered me to a great extent. So how do I actually deal with mental health issues? How do I actually reduce stress? Because the longer you experience stress for, and the more you feel that you're isolated, which is a form of stress in itself, uh, the more likely that you are going to have a mental health disorder, which leads back to more stress, the more that is going to impact on your learning and memory while you're here at the university. And it wasn't until um, I went to a meeting where um, one of the uh, administrators actually said, you know, don't bother sending out emails to your students because students nowadays actually don't bother with email. They're actually more likely if you try to engage them either on a website or through social media, et cetera, and that's how they're gaining their information. I had no idea what they were talking about, to be honest. I had no idea what social media actually represented, but I thought that it would be a really good idea if students were already learning online interacting with each other, developing social networks online, that it would have to be something that I would have to go and take a look at. And it was one of those um, eye-opening moments, again, where I had a student who came in and um, asked me if um, she could add me as a friend on Facebook. I, I actually had no idea what Facebook was, number one. And number two, I didn't really know if I wanted to be this student's friend. Um, <laughs> but in, in, the, in the long run, though, in the long run, um, I decided that um, sh I would ask her, and she did, um, help me to set up a Facebook account. I was her very first friend. I was her, I was 
Uh, she was my only friend for about a year. Um, and <laughs> a, as we went along, one of the things that I discovered was I could actually interact with students. They could understand what I was going to say to them in class, where I could engage them outside of the class. I could make different opportunities uh, available to them even before class started to arrange different types of work or research experiences, etc. And all of these different types of experiences kind of led students to feel a little bit less isolated. It was also one of those things where I looked at um, how I could use uh, different forms of social media to actually uh, use it as a, an effective tool for learning. And one of those things that um, I started to do was to actually stream some of my lectures directly um, over Facebook or other forms of social media. I didn't really care where students were actually learning. To me, it was more important that students were learning. I didn't really care if it was um, a really low, um, low budget type of uh, chalkboard talk that I was giving, as long as students had equal access to it, as long as there was good conversation about different aspects of the course, as long as students were communicating with each other, no longer feeling isolated. This was the type of learning experience that I had wanted when I was an undergrad, that I wanted to use these new developing tools to actually engage these students in. And for the most part, I think that these are the types of things that I would really want um, to have had when I was, when I was an undergraduate uh, student here. I also try as much as possible because I know students now have very, very different needs than back in 2011. I ask students on a routine basis at the very beginning of the school year, what are the biggest challenges for you that, are, that you have coming into my class? How can I get you to come and see me if um, you need to come and see me? Uh, how do you uh, interact with me and how can I communicate more effectively with you? And I think that one of the things that students said that it's, it's often very, very difficult to actually get everything down in lectures. So that's a form of stress. And it's also really stressful for students to not feel like they've missed a lecture and they don't know someone in class to be able to have access to that lecture. And I, I think that one of the things that we can do as educators is to really think a little bit about how we're actually not worrying so much about what we want to deliver in terms of content, but how to make the student experience in terms of learning the key and central point to what we're trying to do here at the university. And I think the last thing that I'd like to mention as well, we know that students also um, have a number of different and diverse learning styles. And we have to be very, very flexible in our approach to this, not just providing them with different types of assets, but also be, being able to give them differentiated learning. And I have a fairly large class, but in that large class, some students will be really good at different types of tests, some students will be really good at different types of assignments. And it's up to us to make sure that we provide them with enough flexibility that they feel like they've actually been able to demonstrate that what they've um, learned is something that they're being evaluated on effectively. And it's challenging. And I'm gonna leave you with my own challenge um, to you as well. Um, so in my life, I've undergone a lot of different changes. And I think that one of the things that I've realized is that if you're going to um, try to make changes, that these types of things don't occur overnight. And a lot of times, uh, we need a lot of insight. We need help, we need feedback from the people that we're trying to work with or work for. And I think that those types of communications are ones that we're not really that great at. And I'm, I'm hoping that whatever your field that you're in, wherever field where you want to be like the best possible detergent maker of all time, that you're gonna go out and um, maybe rethink the way in which you're doing things. Is it really to make, um, the best laundry detergent, or is it really to make someone feel better about the clothes that they're wearing? And I'll kind of leave you with that. Thank you very much.